winnings all. I recently spent a good while in Belgium, which of course you may know is facetiously referred to as a country which is invented to give a place for France and Germany to settle their differences. Facetious or not, however, it seems to have been owned by the Belgians, because if you go to belgiumbattlefield.be, which is a website of the War Heritage Institute, which is the kind of Belgian government body which oversees such things, they are quite proud of the fact that they are the battlefield of Europe and have been for about 2,000 years. So you, know, you think goes, oh, Battle of Waterloo and then Battle of the Bulge. Well, no, no there's, there's a lot more to it. It goes back to the Roman days. We were there at the invitation of the aforementioned War Heritage Institute. And we were lucky enough that uh, Mr. William Testert was our guide as we drove around Belgium, focusing mainly on the World War II and Cold War period. So the facilities that we went to, and we went to a few of them, are oriented to that. And even then, it's not the entire thing. So like the World War I battlefields of Ypres, we didn't go there. We don't have enough time. We only have so much time in the day. So what we have done is over the course of the next while, you are going to see a whole series of videos coming from Belgium and discussing its military history, particularly with regard to the Belgian armed forces. It's a, a force which rather punches above its weight in many respects. So that said, we are going to start off with a small little series of videos on Belgian army history. And then we'll see where we go from there. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the coming series of videos. Greetings all. I am at the Royal Military Museum in Brussels. Standing next to me is Mr. William Testert of the War Heritage Institute, which kind of oversees this museum, correct? Yes, indeed. All right, so before getting into what we are standing in front of, what is the history of this museum? Well, this museum was started in the early 1920s. Uh, it started with a collection uh, on an exhibit and the political powers that be decided that uh, there should be a museum of the First World War, mainly. Uh, so King Albert uh, made a decree and so the Royal Army Museum, uh, Royal Military Museum, as a matter of fact, uh, was created as a scientific uh, and historical uh, organization of the Belgian defense. It was mainly uh, the objective to train and educate the officer corps and also to educate the normal uh, population, of the, the population of Belgium. Uh, it was started in another place and in 1922, if I remember correctly, it came here in these big exhibit halls and since then it stayed here. So the first time that I saw this building would have been about 1987. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's changed. No, that's uh, on purpose. Uh, we try to conserve it just like it is, because this is one of the oldest uh, parts of the museum. And we um, were convinced by the visitors that it should stay like it is, because they were so impressed by it. It has no, its own character. It's really a museum into a museum. And so what is this particular hall? So we, we got like four or five different sections. So just coming outside, there was a little World War II section. You have a World War I section. Mm -hmm. You have an aviation section. What is this section then? Well, this is where you start your tour in the museum because the main entrance is at the end of this section here. So the first part is a little bit Napo Napoleonic on the upper floor of the saint uh, arcades. And then here we start at the beginnings of Belgium and the creation of the Belgian army. Uh, with the Belgian Revolution in 1830, uh, with the first uniforms of the revolutionaries, and then we progress into uh, the more technic technical evolution of the Belgian army, uh, new uniforms, new equipment, uh, the building of the forts to protect the country against uh, invasive uh, thoughts, uh, evolution of weaponry, artillery, uh, and all sorts of uniform. Also the deployment of Belgian troops for the Vatican, volunteer army. Uh, volunteers have been sent to Mexico to protect the emperor of Mexico at a certain time. Also we highlight the fight of Belgian volunteers, military volunteers in the Congo against the Arabic uh, slave uh, traders, which is quite a known story. And so we progress uh, till we come at the, first, the beginnings, the early days of the First World War and the first battles of 1914. And then we go to a new hall where this is more explained in depth. Gotcha. 
So if Belgium was, I mean, Belgium was basically an artificial country, right? I mean, it kind of created, the, the common joke in, the, in England is it was created as a place for Germany and France to settle their differences as a buffer state. Does Belgium have any, shall we say, traditional enemies? Uh, we were known as very. Other than other Belgians. We were we were known as very stiff fighters by the Romans already. Mm -hmm. So we were the only ones to kick out the Romans or Rom the Roman army for a certain time. But indeed, we were always colonized by somebody else. Uh, we got the French, we got the Austrians, we got the Germans, we got the Spanish, we got the Dutch. In the end, we got the Dutch, and so we got fed up with the Dutch, and so we threw them out. And uh, then um, some countries like Great Britain saw an opportunity in this and uh, they said, well, it might be interesting to have a country in the middle of belligerent uh, people like the French and the Germans who always have troubles. And the British from the beginning were the guarantors of this country. And the first king, Leopold, was actually a cousin of Queen Victoria. And he actually came out of London to mm -hmm. become the, Belgian, the first Belgian king. So before Belgium joined NATO, uh, did, would, did it previously have any alliances? So you said Britain was the guarantor of Belgium. So does that mean that Belgium and, and the UK actually had a military alliance? A sort of military alliance, yes. Uh, when Belgium was invaded by the, the Germans, uh, the British immediately declared war to the Germans because they were the guarantors of the, uh, of the country, a uh, neutral country. We, yeah. we, mandatory, we had to be neutral and we kept that neutrality till the Second World War. Uh, by the way, Belgium was one of the founding fathers of NATO. So, and we have the NATO headquarters here in Belgium. So we were always in search of an alliance to protect ourselves a little bit. Uh, even sometimes it didn't work, so they, then we had to fight for it. And in the First World War, we succeeded in keeping the Germans rel uh, on hold, not to take the whole country. Unfortunately, in the Second World War, we were not able to do that. Well, we can talk about the First World War in a little bit, but let's start, I guess, at the beginning of the Belgian army then with the revolution. And I think it's at the other end. You got, a, you got an exhibit? Yes, we have a, one of the first simple uniforms or outfits the civilians donned themselves with to fight the Dutch. Well, let's go uh, have a look at it. Yes, why not? So this uniform would have been from the original uprising with yes. the 10-day war? Yes. No, this is the original uprising. Uh, it's civilians taking up arms against the Dutch army and to recognize themselves they had this simple piece of blue cloth, uh, cloth over them and, and that pretty much was it. You see an example of a guy carrying it there. You also see the first version of the Belgian flag which was different from what we have now. Oh, it's sideways. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, sideways, you see. And there you see the, the soldier or the civilian in Brussels uh, with his uniform as it was in, 19, uh, in 1830. Why blue? Was it just what they happened to have most yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, blue was quite a common color. It was easy to make. It was a light fabric and uh, it's prob probably a practical choice. So how long did you have peace then? Once you created your new country and you created a new army, how long did you have before you were next tested? Well, it was tested uh, back when the Dutch came in, in 1831. Uh, then we well, had to, to fight. To, uh, yeah, then we had to fight, and we had the support of the French army. And after that, we had peace till 1914. So we were even uh, able to get uh, not involved in the French-German War of 1870. Uh, we were neutral, so we didn't uh, budge, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And we, gar the Belgian army, was able to guarantee the neutrality of the country. Uh, except in 1914 with the von Schlieffen plan, uh, the Germans thought that they could uh, cross our country just like that. And was Belgium ready for that? Well, we expected them, but the army was uh, not, really, uh, uh, not really up to par. And so the Germans expected a walkover, uh, which uh, fortunately for us and unfortunately for them was not the case. Right, but it still took over a lot. I mean, you, you look where Ypres is on the map, and <laughs> yes, of course, lot, we had a very small, we had a very small uh, army, but we had the fortress of Liège, and we had the, uh, several older fortresses who tried to slow down the enemy. We also were quite inventive. Uh, we attacked the Germans with steam trains full of ammunition, full of explosives, uh, like a drone, they would yeah, say now. Yeah. So the, f the first time that the, 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 the Germans were very much surprised by the stiffness of the Belgian opposition. Also, the Belgian army put up a good fight. The forts were a little bit awkward because they were not built in armed concrete, yeah. but still the Germans had to bring in a very heavy uh, artillery. 
and the Belgian infantry uh, was very hard with in fighting. Also, the Belgian cavalry stopped a German cavalry charge, an enormous cavalry charge, not by countercharging, but retiring themselves in the tree line and doing a defensive operation. So step by step, we always went back, but slower as the Germans expected. They expected mm -hmm. a few days, right. but it turned out to be a few years. So we did a we slowed down. We went slowly to the fortress of Antwerp, which was called the last, uh, the last the red out. Red yeah. out yes. Uh, unfortunately, like I said earlier, the, fort, uh, the forts were not uh, strong enough to resist to the German artillery. So we were able to create a, a pontoon over the river Skeld and discreetly evacuate the whole of the Belgian army to the other side. And then slowly we retired to the river uh, to Ypres and the river Isaac, where we made our last stand and where we stayed for nearly four years. So Belgium has a, a history of weapons manufacture. I mean, you, you think it's only great, like FN, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, you know, the Liège manufacturers, uh, Sabga and so on. It, was that a recent thing after Belgian independence or has there always been a history of making mm -hmm. weapons there, there and There's always been a history because we had the industry for that in Liège, which was steel. And uh, we always had a history. We, we already made uh, weaponry for uh, the Dutch, for example. Uh, and even earlier than that, we had a, a tradition in, in weapon maker, uh, making weapons, yes. So you, Belgium was basically self-sustaining then? You didn't have to buy things from the French or the British? Or no, we could, uh, we could really uh, produce ourselves, yes. In those days, we were not like now. We're uh, dependent on nearly everybody but uh, not in volumes uh, to sustain a world war. That was not possible. So do not forget that in 1914, all this industry was taken over by the Germans because we had to pull back. So then we had to buy French and British equipment. Yes, of course. A, a country tends to only survive if it has a good army. Otherwise it's lost. Uh, even certainly in those days where the French were trying to get their hands on Belgium discreetly, uh, and the Germans also tried to do something, and the Dutch were still bellicose. So, for example, we had the first fixed garrisons in Europe. In those days, garrison, the, the units were not billeted in fixed garrisons. So the first fixed garrisons were like Zonhove and Leopoldsburg, uh, next to the Dutch border to keep an eye on whatever was happening in, 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 in the Netherlands. So this is one of the first times we had a fixed garrison. So this is one of the things we developed a little bit. Later on, other armies took that over. Uh, also, the Belgian army had to be formed from scratch. There was nothing, mm -hmm. except we had a huge contingent of Polish officers who served in our country, in our country's army. We had Belgian officers who were experienced uh, and battle-hardened because they served in the French army or in the, uh, of Napoleon, because it's only 15 years different yeah. between both uh, the Battle of Waterloo and the independence of Belgium. And also we had other officers who served in the Dutch army. <laughs> and so they were quite experienced. But we had to build everything up, uh, not only the combat units, but also fortresses, artillery, uh, building garrisons, uh, training areas and all that stuff. Huh? Of course, that's just video number one. All right, so the War Heritage Institute, if I didn't mention it earlier, they are the organization which basically controls a whole group of musea within Belgium. And they have a selection of staff, some of whom are civilians and some of whom are actually still serving Belgian military personnel whose assigned duty is to operate these musea. So in addition to the Royal Museum in central Brussels, we went down to Bastogne. A uh, site, of course, famous for the Battle of the Bulge, where McAuliffe said nuts, and a few other things that may have gone on down that neck of the woods. And then later we went up to a Cold War collection near Antwerp. And uh, well, along the way, we ran into all sorts of people, including those involved in restoring the vehicles, operating the vehicles, operating the museum, re reconfiguring the museum. You'll see, if you haven't been to Baston Barracks in the last, oh, four months, they've done some changes. And generally speaking, they just rolled out the red carpet for us and well, we took advantage of the offer. So if you think this is the sort of thing which may float your boat, which I, I get is an odd idiom for a tanker to say, but okay, then feel free to subscribe to the channel and get the notifications when these videos come out. Take care and I'll talk to you then.